Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This episode of Forgotten History is brought to you by Magellan TV, a new type of documentary streaming provider determined to bring you the finest documentaries from around the globe. Today's episode is about two historical mysteries and possible cryptids. The first is about a series of attacks in 18th century France by a creature of uncertain description. Featured in the drama series Teen Wolf, the Beast of Jovadon is an enduring mystery. After that, the History Guy will talk about Washington's Eagle, a species of sea eagle described by famous painter and ornithologist John James Audubon, which has never been proven to exist. And now, let me introduce the History Guy. Between 1764 and 1767, a huge beast terrorized the population in an 80 kilometer square area of southeastern France. It was described as being as big as a calf with a huge maw full of razor sharp teeth and in a three year period it killed more than a hundred people. And if you think that this is just a myth or a legend, it is not. There were dozens of witnesses. The attacks were well documented. Whatever it was, it was something real. And while the attacks stopped in 1767, the beast itself was never positively identified. The Beast of Jovedon is an enduring mystery of history, and it deserves to be remembered. The first attack occurred in the summer of 1764. A young woman who was watching a herd of cattle was charged by a huge beast, the likes of which she had never seen before. But the bulls in the herd managed to fend it off with their horns, and so she escaped with mere scratches. But she described something fantastic, a beast with a huge broad chest, with a massive head and neck. Its ears were on top of its head and they stuck straight up, looking almost like horns. Its greyhound-like maw was full of massive fangs. Its tail, unlike a wolf, was long and thin. It had huge claws and it moved extremely fast. And when it ran, it could leap enormous distances in each leap. The beast attacked dozens of more people in the coming months. It seemed to favor women and children, but it even attacked full-grown adult males. It would often attack people that were alone in the field watching flocks or herds, but it also came into towns and took victims mere feet from their own doorsteps. It favored attacking the head, and most of the victims that were founded had their throats torn out. Sometimes it would carry the bodies away, and virtually all of the bodies were at least partially eaten. In these horrific scenes, the beast would sometimes leave behind just rent limbs and body parts. And there were so many attacks that people became convinced that there must be more than one beast, because some of the reports made it sound like there was more than one attack occurring at the same time. Astoundingly, in October of 1764, two hunters claimed to have come upon the beast and shot it with their muskets at close range several times. Each time the beast staggered, but astoundingly got up again and continued to move away, eventually escaping into the woods. And they were not the only ones who claimed to have shot the beast at close range, only to have it get up and walk away. In 1765, the story reached the attention of the king, Louis XV, who sent several known wolf hunters as well as his own master of the hunt to hunt down and put an end to the beast. They killed a lot of wolves, and at least one extraordinarily large wolf, but it turned out not to be the beast. The attacks resumed. At least a dozen more people died in 1765. The beast continued to terrorize the region clear until June of 1767, when a large hunt was organized by a local nobleman and a local farmer named Jean Chastel shot another huge wolf. The attack stopped, and so it was assumed that that was the beast of Jovedon, and Jean Chastel was a local hero. It is a terrifying story, but were all these attacks really just the result of one extraordinarily large wolf? Well, there are lots of theories about the Beast of Jovedon, but three are most credible. The one that is most commonly accepted is that these attacks were simply the attacks of packs of wolves, and that public hysteria exaggerated the description of the animals. 
Wolves were known to attack livestock in Europe and people as well. Wolves were responsible for at least thousands of deaths in Europe in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. But the patterns don't necessarily fit. Wolves generally attack weaker prey and very rarely attack, say, full-grown humans who could defend themselves. An analysis of the attacks that were attributed to the beasts of Jovedan showed that that beast attacked adults at a rate six times that of other known European wolf attacks. And it would be extraordinarily strange for just wolves in one area to so change their behavior for just that one three-year period of time. A second theory is that the beast might have been a hybrid of a wolf and a dog, possibly a mastiff, and that the beast might have been actually trained by someone to attack people. Some descriptions make it sound like maybe the beast was even outfitted with armor that was made from boar's hide, which would explain why it could be shot and still run away. Also, if it was trained and directed by a human, that would explain why its targets were different than you would expect of normal wolf or dog attacks. And the suspicion falls on the hero farmer, Jean Chastel, who was known to own a very large red mastiff. Now, what his motive would have been is an interesting question, but he did become quite the hero when he supposedly killed the beast. Perhaps he was just a serial murderer who was covering up his own crimes, or maybe he orchestrated the entire thing in order to get assistance in eradicating wolves, who would have been a threat to his livestock. A third theory was proposed recently by German naturalist Karl Hans Taki. Taki theorizes that the beast of Jovedan was, in fact, a sub-adult male lion. That explains some things that the wolf or wolf-dog explanations just don't explain, like how it could leap long distances as it ran, or its use of claws in attack, something that wolves and dogs normally do not do. And while a peasant of the 18th century likely knew what a lion was, the pictures that they had seen, the drawings would likely have been of full-grown adult male lions with full manes. And a sub-adult lion looks quite different and might not necessarily have been recognized. The pattern seems to fit. A sub-adult lion has a dark streak down its back. Of course, the long and thin tail sounds more like a lion than a wolf. Sub-adult lions also sometimes have spots. And the attack patterns and the, the victims that were chosen also are more fitting for a lion than they would be for a wolf. But if the beast of Jovedan was a lion, how did it get to France? Well, Taki's theory there is that it escaped from a menagerie. See, in the, in the 18th century, there was a lot of interest in natural sciences, and so it was quite popular for wealthy people to have collections of exotic animals. The beast of Jovedan was likely brought to France as a lion cub that escaped. And the terror of this particular explanation is that, that means that the beast of Jovedan, who killed more than a hundred people, was the result of human carelessness. The beast of Jovedan is an enduring mystery, and as there is no known genetic material that can be definitively tied to the beast, we might never have a full answer. But maybe exactly what the beast was is the wrong question. Maybe the more important question is what the story of the beast of Jovedan says about history at the time. The Beast of Jovedan was the first real national news story, and it was greatly amplified by a nascent news media that reveled in gory depictions of the attacks in crudely illustrated printed broadsheets. And so it is more than the story of an animal, it's the story of people's perceptions of the attacks, skewed by the politics of an unsettled era, where the power structures and traditional modes of thought were in constant and sometimes violent transition. It came in the middle of the Age of Enlightenment and following the Scientific Revolution, and it represented the juxtaposition, the conflict between superstition and science, and people that were gripped in the conflicting ideas of a new scientific rationalism, but also an obsession with the occult. It represented the complexity of the relationships between the nobility and the peasantry at a time when those very relationships were under question, literally on the doorstep of the French Revolution. And it came at a period when religion and religious understanding was in flux. And as organized religion, which had caused many of the wars of the previous century, was being rejected, there was still a belief in morality where God punished evil, perhaps even by sending a terrifying beast. 
And as the world was thrust into the modern era, it might not matter whether the beast of Jovedon was a wolf or a dog or a lion, because the sum of the people's fears at the time could have transformed any of those into the terrifying beast of Jovedon. And that is the story of the beast of Jovedon, an intriguing mystery if there ever was one. Before we listen to the History Guy talk about Washington's Eagle, now is the part of the podcast where we get to talk to the History Guy directly about these episodes and a little bit about the process of researching and creating these stories. First, let's talk about the Beast. Do you have a personal opinion on what you think the Beast was? Of course, the point of the episode is, is it doesn't matter. That this was a, a representation of an era uh, as things were changing, classes, uh, culture was changing, uh, status was changing, technology was changing, communication technology was changing. And so anything could kind of come together in this culmination of fears. That was the point of the episode. And if you look at it from that perspective, uh, then it's disappointing because the answer is probably the least exciting, least fun, most mundane answer. And that is probably there was no beast of Jovedon. It was a, a group of unconnected wolf attacks that were not uncommon in Europe throughout the Middle Ages. Uh, and those kind of wrapped up with the fears of the time, as well as selling broadsheet newspapers and broader communication and people starting to question whether the nobility could actually protect them in the way they had before. You put all that together, that makes the Beast of Jovedon. But that, of course, isn't the best story or the most fun story at all. And so it's, it's, it's very much a lot of fun to go and look and say, I mean, we know something was going on and something that was extraordinary, you know, enough to set itself apart. Uh, and when you look at those, the one that I found was most compelling was in the, the, the blog that was associated with National Geographic. And that's the, the one that said that if you look at these attacks, who it was attacking and how it was attacking, it looks a lot more like a feline than a canine. Uh, and that was the argument that this could be uh, a lion. Uh, there are male lions that are either juvenile or there are male lions that don't have large manes. Had a dark line down its back. That's a reminiscent of a lion. And the thing is, if you look at and the, the drawings are all over the place. <laughs> These things are all over the place. Uh, it was either like a super sized, uh, like greyhound, or, or it was a lion. I mean, that tail is not a wolf tail. It's a lion tail. And a lion, an actual African lion, might have been able to withstand being hit by a, a 18th century musket and walk away. I think that's interesting. I mean, if I want to tell what seems like the best story to me, that's the one I think is maybe the coolest story about it. Uh, but there was so much going on that every single witness account is unreliable in certain ways. Uh, it seems to me very likely that this could have been something that wasn't all that abnormal, just a really bad season, you know, a few years of, of wolf pack attacks. And that could be the beast of Jovedon. So yeah, you have to say that the Occam's razor probably tells you it was, it was wolves. There, I mean, we talk a lot about fake news today. I mean, but the bottom line is the truth has always been is news is what sells the paper. And if it sells the paper, it'll be news. And the paper will do what it needs to for that to be the news that sells the paper. And that was very true at the time. Uh, and that meant that uh, all sorts of accounts, they're going to take the, you know, the, the more dramatic accounts that were more likely to sell the paper. And so all you can do as a historian is take the best that you've got and then try to pick out, you know, from there where biases might be that might impact stuff and then tell the best story that you've got with the evidence that you have. Well, we've, we've talked about how you watch Magellan TV and we want to thank Magellan for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. What kind of, what kind of stuff you've been watching on Magellan recently? You might assume that I like to watch all the history documentaries, but one of the things that I like about Magellan is it's got a wide range of sort of documentaries because my interest really does go beyond history, even though they've got all sorts of great history. They've got modern history or ancient history or uh, war history or whatever you want to talk about. But the one I, I was watching the other day that was really fascinating to me is that they just put a new one up called uh, Neanderthal Apocalypse. I studied, I mean, I, when back in college, uh, I took anthropology classes and we talked about Neanderthals at the time. And this is talking about about new understanding, new research, new archaeology, and it really transforms everything that I understood about them from whatever 30, 40 years ago when I was in college. And it's really asking the question about why did modern humans survive and why did Neanderthal not? It was it's a lot of fun. And it's that's the sort of reason I watch Magellan TV is I didn't go, I didn't go on there to say, I want to learn about Neanderthals. I went on there and found something that was just interested. And then I was, you know, stuck in it for for an hour. I'm like watching wrapped because I'm I'm learning new things as it went along. What about you? You've also got a subscription to Magellan. You, you've been watching anything? 
Absolutely. You know, actually, me and my me and my wife were watching a, a piece on Eva Braun. And so it was it, I mean, it's about Hitler, too, but it was focusing on Eva Braun and kind of a, a changing, you know, the changing concepts of how what part we thought she played in the history. And it's it's really interesting stuff. Actually, what I thought was most interesting about it is she filmed and took a lot of pictures. You kind of get this idea that that, you know, there wasn't a lot of filming going on of just these personal lives, but there absolutely was. And she's got so much of high ranking Nazi officials and Hitler himself. It is really strange because she's she's a pretty regular German girl hanging out with, you know, people who have become so ubiquitous in history that, that you can't even really separate them from their larger historical context. We actually just hooked it up to our, our Roku TV, which was totally easy. Mm-hmm. There was nothing difficult about it. There's always a deal going on on Magellan TV for our listeners, for our YouTube viewers, and that's at try.magellantv.com slash the history guy. Try.magellantv.com slash the history guy. If you go there, you're going to get some sort of discount so that you can become subscribers to Magellan TV. I really, I grew up watching documentaries. I love watching document documentaries. I learned from Magellan TV all the time. I watch Magellan TV all the time. And it's great to hear what someone else is watching because you can just flip on there and then stumble into something that you didn't even think about and say, wow, you know, this is fascinating. And it's funny because that's kind of the vibe that we're going for on the History Guide too. Because they're adding new stuff every every week, every time you come back to it, there's going to be something new for you to, for you to it's, watch. It's a, it's a great product. Love Magellan TV and really grateful that they're willing to sponsor our podcast. The next episode is actually one of my very favorites, and it's about Washington's eagle. Essentially, you know, from the from the historical record, we have this one painting by John James Audubon, but it's a huge mystery because other than having this one image, we have almost nothing else of it. We've got a handful of descriptions. And so the mm-hmm. first question, I guess, is do you personally, do you think this eagle was or is real? And there are some, there were some samples that were supposedly collected, but those specimens have all disappeared in various ways, which is really interesting. Uh, one was in a private collection in England and it was sold off at some point and they had no record over who bought it and others supposedly destroyed in fires. And so it's, it's really tantalizing. Uh, I'd like to say, I mean, first of all, there are experts on this sort of thing. And I think if you look at the ornithological community, that the consensus generally is that there wasn't a Washington's Eagle, that there's something wrong there. Uh, I can understand why they might feel that way. But I mean, it's very hard for me to discount John James Audubon. I mean, that this, no matter what you want to say, because there were some flaws in his science. I mean, there's his his paintings were anatomically, they were amazingly correct, but I mean, he included some things in the birds of North America that weren't North American birds, specimens that someone else had collected and he bought them and he painted them and it turns out they're only in South America. So, I mean, you can say that there's flaws in what he's doing. And you can also say that he was trying to sell something because one of the ideas is that maybe he made up Washington's Eagle. That just doesn't make a lot of sense to me when you look at, I mean, he would have known, John James Audubon would have known and would have known quite well if he had a specimen of a golden eagle or an immature bald eagle or all the explanations to try to give. He would not have uh, painted the things that are different from those. He wouldn't have painted them that way. I mean, he has all these hundreds of prints that are so incredibly accurate that we're going to say that, yeah. but he, you know, miscounted, you know, how this, how this bird went together. It doesn't make any sense to me. And the way that he gauged a bird's size was very precise and very specific. So it's, it's hard for me to imagine the other stories. And that is that he could have mistaken a specimen to something else or that he could have created this thing out of his imagination. It just doesn't fit with his amazing, you know, astounding body of work. And so it's hard for me to say that anything other than Washington's Eagle at least was extant at the time uh, that he got a specimen and painted that specimen. Now, it might be uh, that 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 species was already near extinction and that there were very few uh, in the time what it was in the 1830s when he was traveling off into the hinterlands of America, uh, you know, in the really the wilderness at the time. Uh, and so it might be that there were only a few at the time and they're no longer existent. There's several extant. There's several species that he painted in in his work, the, the birds of North America, that uh, that are extinct today. And one of those might be Washington's eagle. Uh, and so he maybe was one of the last people to see a cryptid species that is that went extinct shortly thereafter and of which we don't have yeah. any example. And if that's true, that just makes you wonder how much might have been even here in North America, even when Europeans first started arriving in North America that was gone before the Europeans ever went and found it. Uh, occasionally, if you watch, there's people who think they might have sighted 
Washington's eagle, and those pop up from time to time. But that it's it's a lot harder to imagine that something so magnificent as an eagle that would have been stood five feet tall, uh, that uh, that something that magnificent could be around extant in North America, and we wouldn't you know have found it and know where it lives and be taking pictures of it every day. Uh, it's a lot more credible to believe that it could have been in 1820 or 1830, mm -hmm. very small populations of those uh, that uh, then, you know, disappeared before, you know, became more populous. So I, I would say that it's, it's easier for me to believe that it did exist than it is for me to believe that it does exist. But it's still, I mean, if tomorrow, if someone came and said, you know, we've discovered these, you know, this, this group of eagles and they're not the species, they're not golden eagles, they're not bald eagles, they're a whole different species. It wouldn't, to me, be outside the realm of possibility. I mean, it's, it's amazing some of the things that we've found, if you look at some of the stories of other cryptids like the coelacanth or the okapi or things that people didn't think existed yeah. and they did. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that it's likely that someone's gonna come in with a Sasquatch body tomorrow, uh, but I think it is quite possible that there are species, even fairly spectacular species on earth uh, that even in the modern era, we haven't documented well. And Washington's Eagle could be one of those. It's certainly a better story if Washington's eagle is real. So I say at the end of that episode, I say, no matter, you know, whatever else you want to say about it, I still look out my window each day and I wonder if it's going to be sitting in a tree because it would just be a great story if it was. I honestly think it had to have been real and that he had a specimen of it at that he painted. But and, it's, and it's more than the pen. I mean, he described them as uh, living on the, as nesting on the ground. He described them as sea eagles. They were grabbing fish out of the sea. That is, I mean, it looks like a golden eagle. It acts like a bald eagle. It, it nests like neither of them. I mean, it's, it, it, he would have to have been, you know, making up a whole species. Now, on the other hand, if anyone knew enough about birds to credibly make up a species, I guess you could say that Audubon could. I just don't see why he would. Well, thank you to the history guy for taking some time to talk about these mysteries. And now we're going to talk about Washington's eagle. First described by John James Audubon in 1826, he claims to have had multiple encounters with the elusive bird, and to have shot and collected specimens of an eagle much larger than either the golden or the bald eagle, and which had unique behaviors. Despite his claims of evidence, since the 19th century all examples seem to have been lost or destroyed, and it isn't clear if the bird actually existed. With that, I'll let the history guy tell you about John James Audubon and his eagle. When you think about exciting history, the history of ornithology, the study of birds, doesn't necessarily come first to mind, but passion is a wonderful thing and brings an excitement of its own. As poet Maya Angelou once said, a bird does not sing because it has an answer. It sings because it has a song. John J. Audubon had such a song. This is a story of a man's passion of one of the world's most valuable books, and of a magnificent lost bird. And it is a story that deserves to be remembered. Audubon's story started as all great stories do, with being captured by pirates. I'm actually not joking. John J. Audubon's father was a sea captain and a privateer, and at one point he was actually captured by pirates. And it's not really relevant to the story, but I just couldn't leave that part out. John J. Audubon was born in Haiti, and he moved as a child with his family to France. And eventually he immigrated to the United States, where he tried to make a business on some land that his father had bought here. He worked his hand at a number of businesses with varying success, but his true love was the combination of art and nature. And while other pursuits and the need to feed his family kept him from pursuing his dream as much as he wished, at the age of 35, he decided to undertake an extraordinary project to document by painting every species of bird in America. Audubon traveled the American West in the first half of the 19th century, hunting birds and paying other hunters to bring him specimens. It was a time when the backwoods of America were not just dangerous and wild, but when the birds were so plentiful that a single flock of the now extinct passenger pigeon could take three days to pass overhead and might have included tens of billions of birds. It's a time when the forests were endless and settlers, especially European ones, were few and far between. 
Autobahn was trained in both art and taxidermy. He developed innovative methods of using wire and string to mount taxidermy birds in natural poses, and he would mount his specimens on a grid so that he could accurately represent their proportions. He eschewed oil painting, which was the most common type of painting in the day, and instead preferred a mix of watercolors, charcoals, and pastels. He engaged talented landscape artists who would paint the landscapes and the plants that are in many of his pictures. And unlike most works of natural science in their time, he posed the birds in natural poses against natural settings, engaging in natural activities. It was not an easy task, and it didn't pay particularly well. At times to make ends meet, he had to take artistic commissions or take work teaching art. But his 12-year opus work is nothing short of astounding. First published in 1827, the Birds of America identified 25 new species and 12 new subspecies of birds, and included prints of at least six species of birds that are now extinct. It is considered one of the finest ornithological works ever produced. The four-volume work was reproduced using both copper-plated etching and engraving, and each of the prints was then hand-colored using watercolors. Audubon paid for this expensive printing process by selling subscriptions. Subscribers would pay as they go for prints that were produced each month. Among his subscribers were King Charles X of France, Adelaide, the Queen Consort of England, and famous American politicians Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. It's estimated that there were only about 200 original copies of this extraordinary work, and of those, only around 120 are known to still exist today. And in that work, there is an enduring mystery. Falco Washingtoni, or Washington's Eagle. Audubon named the species, which he presumed to be newly discovered, after George Washington. It was an exceptional bird, a uniformly red-brown sea eagle over three and a half feet tall with a 10-foot wingspan that was more than 25% larger than the other two species of known American eagles, the bald eagle and the golden eagle. Audubon noted sighting the bird just five times in his extensive travels and claimed to have shot one for taxidermy, which he used to document its astounding dimensions and many characteristics that distinguished it from other known eagle species. But the problem is that modern ornithologists don't agree that the bird exists or in fact ever existed. There were other ornithologists who claimed to have had sightings, and there were a few specimens that people claimed were collected, but none of those specimens can be found today. They've all been lost, sold into private collections without record, destroyed by fire, in museum records, but the sample cannot be found. And there has not been one confirmed sighting in the modern era. Ornithologists generally consider it to be a misidentification, either of an exceptionally large golden eagle or of a juvenile bald eagle who at different times in their development have brown rather than white heads. But neither of these explanations fit. First of all, the bird was known to catch fish, making it clearly a sea eagle as opposed to the golden eagle, which is a true eagle. And it lacked the distinctive extended leg feathers that distinguish golden eagles. It was described as having uniformly brown feathers, and bald eagles, even in those stages where their heads are not white, would have mottled colors with some white feathers mixed in. And, and it had distinguishing factors in terms of the color of its beak and the scaling of its legs, as well as in behaviors like nesting on the ground on cliff sides instead of up in trees that simply do not fit the other two eagle species. And Audubon was not the only one who claimed to have seen them. Other ornithologists claimed to at least have sightings of the bird. And of course, this is John J. Audubon, who would have witnessed hundreds of eagles and been quite familiar with the other two species. But if it's a real species, how did it just disappear? Well, maybe it didn't. It was always known to be an extremely rare species, and its habitat is not heavily populated. As we've seen, it can be confused for golden eagles and bald eagles, and its sheer size means that when someone did see one, that sighting might have been written off as an exaggeration. In the end, the man who had trouble feeding his family did okay for himself. The Birds of America earned him enough money that he could buy a 20-acre estate in New York. He continued his scientific endeavors. He documented 36 species of birds on a trip to Newfoundland and Labrador in 1833. 
1848, he started showing signs of Alzheimer's disease, and he passed away in 1851. His contribution to our understanding of bird anatomy and bird behavior was far-reaching. His book was quoted three times in Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species. He won numerous awards and honors, including election to the prestigious Royal Society, which would have been the highest honor for a scientist of his day. And there are several parks, preserves, museums, galleries, schools, and even a 13,226-foot-tall mountain peak in Colorado named after John J. Audubon. His seminal work, The Birds of America, has become one of the most valued books in the world. Of the 120 copies known to exist, only about 13 are in private hands. One sold at auction in London in 2010 for $11.5 million. According to Economist magazine, five of the top ten highest prices ever paid for a book at auction were copies of The Birds of America. But don't fret. Many of the other copies that are institutionally owned are in universities in the United States and Europe, where they are frequently put on display. And the University of Michigan has put all 425 plates onto their website, where you can view them today. Today, Audubon's name is nearly synonymous with bird conservation. In 1895, a fan of his used his name when he created a society dedicated to bird conservation. And today, the National Audubon Society, which is dedicated to the conservation of birds and their habitats, has more than 500 local chapters. Ornithologists have still not agreed to the existence of Falco Washingtoni. But there have been a few immature sightings in recent years, and there are some scientists that are still making the bird's case. I, for one, truly want to believe. I look out my window every day, hoping to see Washington's eagle sitting in a tree. I hope that because it's, it's such a good story. It is a symbol of a man and his passion, of a lost frontier, of a time in history when the flocks of birds were so big that they blocked out the sun. And I want to believe that all good stories are true. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope that you enjoyed the presentation, and if you did, remember that you can find more stories of forgotten history on our YouTube channel at The History Guy. History deserves to be remembered. We will continue to release podcasts every other week, so stick around if you want more podcasts on forgotten history. You can also find us at our website, thehistoryguy.net, and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon. Until next time, this is Josh, signing off.